everybody. Thank you and welcome to the call. Today, our guest lecture will be Manenga Mungandi. Uh, Manenga is a mobile applications developer who has worked at 227, an app that gives South Africans insights on how to spend their money. From smart categorization of their money, uh, from smart categorization to alerting them about suspicious transaction, he, he now works at Luno, at Luno uh, a cryptocurrency wallet and exchange, so, uh, exchange serving 5 million customers from across 40 uh, countries. So I'm just going to hand over to you, Mr. Manenga. Would you like to share your video and introduce yourself? Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Welcome to my talk. Let me just get the slides ready. Okay, can you see the, the intro slide? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Um, good afternoon, everyone, again, and welcome to my talk, a look into blockchain and digital ownership. My name is Manenga Mungandi, and I'm speaking to you from South Africa's mother city of Cape Town. I'm excited to be speaking today because it's my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. I hope you're watching this. We have a very interesting agenda set out for today. Some of you may have already picked this up from the poster, but for those who haven't, allow me to outline it once more. We'll start by looking into blockchain, what it is and how it's used looking at Bitcoin and what makes it so special. We'll take a quick break before moving on to the age of digital art. I'll then talk a bit about how this technology has been used in the art world with physical art, concluding my talk with a Bitcoin giveaway, followed by a Q&A session. So with all that said, let's begin. Personally, I would describe blockchain as a decentralized, distributed, and oftentimes public digital led ledger consisting of records called blocks that are used to record transactions across many computers, um, so, so much so that each one of those computers have the exact same blocks and transactions. So just to recap, a block con contains a bunch of transactions and blocks are already ordered and linked to each other, making it virtually impossible to retroactively alter previous blocks without having to alter its subsequent blocks as well. I would like to use a simple analogy to rephrase these statements. First, think of what it was like when doing group work at school. Only one person took notes and the rest of the group had to copy them. Or everyone took notes and the group had to spend time reconciling them and making sure they had the right information. This was okay at the time, but it left room for problems like missing notes or even just incorrect notes. Now imagine there was another way to do this. Let's say using Google Docs. We all know how that works. As soon as notes are taken, a record is created and the copy is made for each one, for, for everyone in the group. And everyone can see who contributed which section. And um, that's revolutionary, right? I'm not saying Google Docs uses blockchain technology but it is distributed and decentralized. The main difference being is there's no need for consensus, meaning 
if you want, if I wanted to change the title of our group project to say the 12 laws of Bitcoin, no one is able to get ahead of that and stop me. My changes would be saved and someone else would have to come and change it to the title that they want. However, on the blockchain, my changes would need to be reviewed and confirmed before they are added and distributed. Blockchain technology is new and constantly evolving, being applied to new fields in new ways every single day. If someone walked up to you and said, they have a complete understanding of blockchain and all its uses, you'd better run the other way. Personally, I'm taking the scholarly route and learning every time I look into it. Let's watch a video to further illustrate this. Blockchain enables cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it has many more applications. After all, it's all about verification and trust. Instead of relying on an accountant, appraiser, or an auction house to keep an accurate database of an art's provenance, blockchain allows the whole world to watch. The chain of these records is copied on thousands of computers, making it virtually impossible for anyone to cook the books, or in this case, forge a piece of art. So, we just spoke about blockchain and how it works. Now, let's chat about how it's used. This brings us to Bitcoin, a new type of money. If you searched, what is Bitcoin on Google, you would get about 135 million results. Described as the official money of the internet by some and the scam of the decade by others, Bitcoin is slowly becoming a household name. Bitcoin came on the scene and started being traded only about a decade ago. The domain bitcoin.org, which is seen there in that screenshot, was registered on August 18, 2008. And later that year, on October 31st, 2008, a link to a paper authored by Satoshi Nakamoto titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system was posted to a cryptography, a cryptography mailing list. Nakamoto built the Bitcoin software as an open source code and released it in January, 2009. And around this point, Bitcoin was still very much in a proof of concept stage. So much so that a programmer named Lao Hunches, I hope I have not butchered his name, I probably have. The programmer named Lazo spent 1,000 Bitcoin on two Papa John pizzas. Today, that's worth 1.8 billion rand. Talk about slicing through your savings. It's important to note that, a, that Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that makes use of blockchain technology. In fact, Bitcoin popularized blockchain technology as a proof of concept for it. Blockchain has gone on to have many more use cases beyond Bitcoin and finance. So now let's look at why Bitcoin is so innovative and what's so special about it. I would say many things, but let's just focus on three. Scarcity, diversibility, and fungibility. Let me explain what I mean by each of these. Bitcoin is scarce because there are only 21 million coins that can ever be made. And it's based on the idea of blocks which are already linked and thus cannot be changed. Bitcoins are also divisible up to 100 million times, allowing you to transact with the utmost precision. 
And lastly, Bitcoins are fungible, which means they can be exchanged with other individual goods and assets of the same type. Thus, all Bitcoins are equal. No exchange rates, no special addition Bitcoins, everything's the same. You see a few slides with a tag in the bottom right corner, questions for Manenga. And those were questions that I have got, that I gathered uh, before this talk. Um, and they're contextual to each topic. So this is the first one. What determines Bitcoin's price? Long story short, supply and demand. When demand increases, the price increases. When demand falls, so does the price. Simple as that. But you may be wondering, then why is it so volatile? I would say two things. Because of its position, being positioned as the money of the internet, it allows, well, it um, can be attacked by speculation. So that affects how people feel about it. It affects how um, people trade. The second thing is the number and the value of the trades. Because Bitcoin is a relatively small market compared to what it could be, it doesn't take significant amounts of money to move the price up and down. And over the years, it's become harder and harder and it needs more money for you to do this. As more Bitcoin is mined and more people uh, trade, the Bitcoin price starts to stabilize. In fact, right now, 2020 is one of the years that they're claiming is doing better than the last previous years. We've had about, we've been above $10,000 per Bitcoin for close to half of the year. So how much do you think is actually traded and how much has changed over the years? A lot. Quick answer, I would, well, looking at coin market cap, $20 billion worth of Bitcoin is traded or has been traded on average every day. This number was $30 million seven years ago in 2013. And it stayed around that all the way up to 2016 with some spikes and dips and crossing $1 billion for the first time in 2017. And since then, it's come 20 fold. And you may be thinking, what about in, in South Africa? How, what's the, what's the adoption like? I would say the adoption is very good in South Africa. It may be one of Bitcoin's leading markets around the world with over a thousand Bitcoins traded and 3000 people buying their first crypto every single day. As fascinating as that was, let's move on. Blockchain being a publicly distributed ledger promotes transparency, which means anyone can look up any transaction anytime. And now I'll show you what that looks like. So the screenshot in the slide is from blockchain.com who offers a Bitcoin Explorer, which allows anyone to look up any transaction as long as they have the transaction ID, block ID, or even the wallet address of the owner. So what is that? What is that wallet address? That um, bunch of characters there in the top that is a reference to the owner of, um, of this wallet. And as you can see, we can see all the transactions that have occurred on this wallet. We can see all the fees that have been paid. We just can't see who it belongs to. 
And that's the beauty of Bitcoin, promoting anonymity, only showing what information needs to be shown, which is the amount, the date, the transactions, and who it went to. Blockchain.com also offers an Ethereum Explorer, which is slightly different, but works exactly the same. More on this later. So that's Bitcoin in a nutshell. How about we watch a video to wrap this whole thing up? What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency. Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet. Compared to other alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net, without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that the fees are much lower. You can use them in every country. Your account cannot be frozen, and there are no prerequisites or arbitrary limits. Let's look at how it works. Several currency exchanges exist where you can buy and sell Bitcoins for dollars, euros, and more. Your Bitcoins are kept in your digital wallet on your computer or mobile device. Sending Bitcoins is as simple as sending an email. And you can purchase anything with Bitcoin. The Bitcoin network is secured by individuals called miners. Miners are rewarded newly generated Bitcoins for verifying transactions. After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger. Bitcoin opens up a whole new platform for innovation. The software is completely open source and anyone can review the code. Bitcoin is changing finance the same way the web changed publishing. When everyone has access to a global market, great ideas flourish. Bitcoins are a great way for businesses to minimize transaction fees. It doesn't cost anything to start accepting them and it's easy to set up. There are no chargebacks and you'll get additional business from the Bitcoin economy. For more information about Bitcoin, visit weusecoins.com. So that's Bitcoin. I uh, initially planned to take a break, um, but for the interest of time, I'm just gonna press forward. Okay, so now that we're done with the basics, I trust everyone is ready and excited for the next part of the talk. The age of digital art. We've all tried our hand at drawing, painting, and creating art in different forms. Some of you have succeeded and some of us have not. But now some of us can create art programmatically. Introducing CryptoPunks. A collection of 10,000 unique collectible characters with proof of ownership stored on the Ethereum blockchain. Each character you see there is a valuable work of art. Let's have a closer look. Most are punky looking guys and girls, but there are a few rare types like apes, zombies, and even aliens. Every punk has their own profile page that shows their attributes as well as their ownership for sale status and ownership history. This is CryptoPunk 4043 and someone owns it. Not the copyright to a picture, they own the picture itself. You can, of course, download a version of it, but it's just a copy. Someone owns the original. It's art and it has an owner. Around how much would you think these things are worth? Let's look at CryptoPunk 6487, the highest sold punk at least that I know of, sold for a whopping 100 Ethereum, which is roughly 620,000 Rand at Ethereum's price today. The average punk goes for roughly three Ethereum. In today's market, that's close to 18,000 Rand. It's important to note that each of these interesting characters were initially given away for free 
by the CryptoPunk creators. And CryptoPunks was the first non-fungible token and the inspiration for the Ethereum ERC721 standard that powers most digital art and collectibles. Remember, I mentioned in an earlier section that Bitcoin is fungible because all Bitcoins are equal. This is not the case with collectible items like these, where the value is in the eyes of the beholder. So that's my take, but let's see how the creators describe it. Object. When the art is purely digital, nothing more than a binary code collection of ones and zeros. John Watkinson is the co-creator of CryptoPunks, a groundbreaking pixel art sensation. In 2017, he and co-creator Matt Hall created 10,000 CryptoPunk characters. They kept 1,000 for themselves, then offered up the rest online for free. There's male, female, and there's a few rarer types. So you can see there's a zombie, an ape, the most rare is an alien, there's nine of those. We wanted to make it so that there was sort of a scope of rarity. Each character was assigned a link in the Ethereum blockchain, so the authenticity, scarcity, and ownership of the punks was all instantly and globally provable. Nerdy art collectors soon began buying and selling crypto punks, spurring an active online market. We sort of hit a nerve, I think, in that the audience that was into these currencies, the art appealed to them and the collectible aspect uh, appealed to them. It all worked together. But it also was just an interesting answer to the question, like, do you feel like you own these things? And, and the answer was yes. Right now, the average value of the crypto punks, including the common ones, is about $40 to $50. But the high watermark? One rare alien, which sold for $16,000. It's a little different than having a painting on your wall, but I think it's clearly something that's coming because the younger generations are totally comfortable with digital ownership and digital things feel real to them. So it feels like it's something that will naturally become more prominent. So if you thought that was cute, it gets even cuter. There are a number of similar collections that have popped up since. Crypto Kitties being the most well known. So CryptoKitties is a game centered around breedable, collectible, and also adorable creatures we call CryptoKitties. Each cat is one of a kind and 100% owned by you. It cannot be replicated, taken away, or destroyed. Based on how cute these things are, you'd expect them, you'd expect a big market for them. And you'd be right. And if you're thinking, hmm, I wonder how much these are worth. I'll tell you. The lowest you can get um, one for is just over a thousand rand. And the most valuable one I could find, three million rand. That's not even the highest piece sold. So why am I showing you this? I think it's a new medium for your art. It's already monetized, it's verifiable, ownership, digital ownership, and even royalties can be arranged. My goal is to get you thinking about how you can use this information to come up with something that makes sense for you or your community. Coming up, to the final part of the talk. Let's switch things up a little bit and start with a video this time. Oh no. There we go. Now how some in the art world are using technology to help guarantee the authenticity of their work and help ensure artists get paid. It's a story that's a mix of art and technology. Miles O'Brien has the story for our latest segment on the leading edge of technology and part of our ongoing breakthrough series. In the capricious world of fine art, 
there is little that is fair and equitable for the artists themselves. If you're at the top, your work can fetch astronomical prices. This David Hockney painting sold for $90 million in 2018, but Hockney's cut, zero. And of course, for the vast majority of artists, zero is an all too familiar number. They don't call them starving for nothing, but technology may be changing the landscape with some bold brushstrokes. I am a big proponent of what I call the new art economy. Artist and entrepreneur Jackie O'Neill is doing her part to create that new economy. She started a company called the Blockchain Art Collective. She believes helping artists monetize their work begins with a better system for identifying what is real and what is fake. For $10, she sells artists a little gadget you might have implanted in your dog to keep him or her from being lost, a radio frequency ID chip. So if you try to remove it, it will fall apart into a bunch of little pieces, and then the microchip pieces will void once you get to the point of actually removing that. A smartphone app can scan the RFID, which stores information about the piece, the artist, title, date, medium, area, region, and origin. And it has a unique identification number. It's a way to prove it is authentic. Authenticity basically says that this rare, precious, unique object is what people claim it is. And it's hard to prove that often. So when people are going and trying to prove authenticity or provenance, they'll usually go to the expert. Experts usually are art historians. Anyone who watches the Antiques Roadshow knows how that works. Authenticity, scarcity, and value determined by seasoned experts, sometimes leading to thrilling moments. I would suggest an estimate of 200,000 to 300,000. That's so much. <laughs> so that's the Blockchain Art Collective. Very interesting. Gives physical objects a digital identity stored on the blockchain. See the illustration on the left. Take a physical object, put on the smart certificate, and that certificate is linked to an entry on the blockchain. So it has all the benefits of it and more. If adopted well, I think it will save galleries a lot of pain that's caused by dealing with fakes and curation. And hopefully it will actually benefit artists too. But what if it could be much easier? I think it could be as simple as taking a picture without having to place an extra certificate or tag on the piece. Well, Magnus app achieved this in 2016 and was dubbed the Shazam for art. It's rumored that the app worked so well that questions started popping up about how it worked. And it emerged that some of the data that powered the app, including art prices and images of the art were in fact stolen from existing databases and individual art galleries. It faced many challenges and was hence removed from the app stores. A sad story with a message in there by respecting copyright law. Another app with a similar premise is Smartify, described as the world's most downloaded museum app and our final case study of the day. This app is brilliant and you don't have to take my word for it. See for yourself. The video doesn't have audio but just watch how quickly the artwork is identified and how the story is presented, how much information is in there. Not only does it offer this detailed history, it also offers audio guides and audio tours. Sadly, it's only available at a few galleries and museums and it requires quite a bit of initial curation to get it working just right. 
And simple things like lighting are limiting factors. And to top it all off, it's not stored on the blockchain. Perhaps that's something they might consider. That said, the future of the art world is bright. Opportunities are endless. And that's something to look forward to. In closing, I just wanna say that there are many ways we can express and share our culture. We choose to do so through art and technology gives us many ways to preserve the art we create. Blockchain being the newest way, with blockchain being the newest way, I hope my talk gets you thinking about what way works for you. Okay. One more thing, Bitcoin giveaway. I'm sure some of you may be thinking that that was cool. How do I get started? I would literally just give you some Bitcoin right now if I could, but that's not how it works. You need to have a cryptocurrency wallet and a Bitcoin address that I can send Bitcoins to. My personal recommendation is Luno, and this is how you get started in three easy steps. Step one, download the Luno app on your phone or visit the website with my referral link, which will be posted uh, in the chat later. Step two, sign up and verify your identity. As much as Bitcoin promotes an anonymity, it's always good practice to know who you're doing business with. So most exchanges require customers to uh, verify the identity and um, they keep that information private. And uh, that's just best practice. So make sure your information is accurate and as it will be needed in the next step, which brings me to the next step and final step, which is deposit and buy 500 Rand worth of Bitcoin. So here you need to find your Luno wallet with your local currency by sending it uh, to Luno using your unique Uno, Luno reference, and then you'll be able to buy Bitcoin. Once that's done, we'll both receive a referral bonus from Luno with about a dollar or 25 uh, Rand. And um, on top of that, I will be giving the first three people who complete these steps an extra 300 Rand of Bitcoin at my own cost. Because I've enjoyed speaking here today and I wish something like this had happened to me when I first heard about cryptocurrency. Before moving on to discussion, just a few things to note about this giveaway. It's, um, it's gonna go to the, the first three people who will get that extra 300 Rand but everyone else will just get the, the normal Lunar referral. And you have to be a new Lunar user. So if you're ready, if you're ready with Lunar, apologies, you'll not be getting the, the giveaway. And I keep mentioning values and amounts in RANDs, but Luno is actually international. So just check if it's uh, accepted in your region and you should be able to complete the same steps and still claim the reward. Also, you need to hurry up before someone else claims it. So I'll keep this information up um, for a minute or so and I will definitely post that in the chat. Okay, so that, I hope you enjoyed my talk. And um, before we get into a discussion, I just wanna remind you that I'm speaking here 
in my own personal capacity and will not be giving any explicit financial advice. Um, I will, however, share my own understanding and how I would go about doing things. Um, I'm also still researching the topic, so I welcome all sorts of questions. Um, that said, let the discussions begin. You may send your questions through, and I'll do my best to answer them. Hi, Malenga. Thank you very much for this really, really insightful and engaging um, guest lecture. I think we all learned quite a lot about the Bitcoin space and even more interestingly, the, the, the art of the, the, the digital age of art. I think that was actually really exciting to hear about and just the ways in which people can, you know, um, um, preserve um, their cultural artifacts and even objects that they create. Um, I see we do have, I think it was four questions that came in. Uh, two of which are in the Q&A and then two I think came in the chat. I also just want to say to everyone in the call, please raise your hands if you would like to ask the question directly using voice and we will unmute you. Um, but can you see the questions on your side, Manenga? Uh, no, I cannot. I think okay. I have to stop sharing. No problem. I will read the first two questions for you. So, uh, Sui Innocent uh, asked, what does it take to mine Bitcoin as uh, mine a Bitcoin as the first question? Okay. Um, I would say it takes, you need quite a, a number of things. You need to have um, a server, like uh, a computer that's constantly running and uh, racing to complete and verify transactions. Because the, the whole process of mining is, um, say I'm trying to send you Bitcoin and I make, I make the request to add it to, to the block. And um, it's not gonna be added unless it's verified, which means at the position I'm adding it, I show the history of all the other transactions that's happened. And if that is verifiable, someone else has to um, do some calculations to, to uh, verify that. So that is what mining is. And the reason you need a server or a strong computer is because you're competing with um, everyone else around the world to do that. And the more processing power you have, the quicker you can do, you can mine the Bitcoin. I hope that answers. The question. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Um, the second question also from uh, Sui Innocent is how can an individual create a personal crypto punk or crypto kitty? Okay, that's a very interesting question. I think an, in, an, an individual would have to create their own version of that. Um, I, yeah. So definitely the, the CryptoPunks, CryptoKitties, open source. Um, but once again, you, it's very difficult to just add to, to what's existing. They are all already linked from the start. Um, maybe I misunderstood maybe you'd be looking to create your own version of that. And um, I'd say that's, that's a whole nother story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think Sui also sent a message in the chat saying, thank you. Uh, you've answered the, the, the question. And then the second uh, additional questions are from the chat that I'm pulling for you now is if you forget okay. your phone, can you hear me? Yeah, I just, I also have one prepared question. I just want to squeeze in there. Okay, no, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a question from Elijah and it reads, how difficult is it to gauge the performance of various cryptocurrency and their performance against each other? Thanks for that question, Elijah. I think this is an excellent question. Something I think about often. I think there are many ways to do this. Um, you could look at the price changes over a duration of time. 
Um, you could look at volumes traded or even the market cap of, of the coins, um, which is the total amount, the, the total value of the entire market of say Bitcoin versus Ethereum. What I like to do personally is look at the price changes of the last day or the last week and compare, compare those at, at a short term, uh, short term view. Okay, that's, that's my question. So you can, can throw me another. Awesome, thank you. So the next question in the, is, this one I'm pulling from the chat, um, was if yeah. it is from Sibu Siso. So the question is, if you forget your password or username, can you easily recreate or easily access your account through a forget password? Uh, when using products and services, uh, yeah, when using products and services using Bitcoin blockchain. The, that was the first question. I'm just going to also uh, add additionally says the question ultimately is, once you create a ledger and it, it's an error, can you easily edit or how do you correct that error? Humans are prone to errors. Wow, that's some fire, fire questions up in the <laughs> chat. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start with the, the one that I think is easier, which is the first one, which was, sorry, could you repeat that again, just to make sure I understand it properly. I'll repeat it for you now. So the question was, uh, if you forget, I, I'll, I'll say actually the, the second question, I think, because he was reframing the first question. So uh, oh, okay. the, yeah, the second question is, the question ultimately is, once you create uh, a ledger and it has an error, can you easily edit it or how do you correct the errors human? And, and then additionally, what they say is humans are prone to errors. Okay, so yeah, I agree with that uh, sentiment. Humans are definitely prone to errors and it's nice to have a way to, to fix them. Um, you may not like this answer, but <laughs> The way that would happen is you'd probably fix it further down along the chain. So there will still be evidence of that error and, and all of that, but it could be fixed uh, along the chain, which could be done by uh, creating a fork. Um, one example of this is Bitcoin Cash. So there's Bitcoin, brilliant idea, everyone loves it. And people found other ways in which it can be made better. And they proposed them and they got uh, a split decision of whether they should do it or not. So the solution was to create a, a fork, which is just a, a diversion in the initial chain, which created a new currency on this side and then Bitcoin continued going on um, on its side. So that's, yeah, that's how it is dealt with. And um, with regards to losing access to your wallet, um, but losing your password and stuff, I would say many people have lost Bitcoins that way. And unfortunately, there's no, in, there's no inbuilt way to deal with that. Um, one good way is, Exchanges and wallets would usually take care of that for you. So if, if you sign up with Luno and you lose your password, Luno still has your identity and know who you are, can reset the password for you, and it's fine. If you, uh, if you opted to do that by yourself uh, without going through any exchange, because you can buy Bitcoin by yourself, it's just, it's, it's just very technical, and that's where you take full risk. Thank you, thank you very much. I think there was also a comment here on the question from Bayers now. I hope I pronounce your name and surname correctly. I think they were also commenting in addition to the first question from Sui, where they said, if you, yeah. have, if you have a spare computer, you can join a mining pool online and get rewarded with, small portion, uh, with, with, small, with a small portion of the rewards. Um, I think that was with regards to that question about how you can get started with mining. And then there was an additional question from Brian Mutai. Um, and his question is, 
Are there any tools we can use to get started on creating verifiable, unique art on blockchains like, like Bitcoin and Ethereum? Okay, um, firstly, thanks, Bears, for that. I forgot about that. There's, there are a lot of ways to join mining pools. There's a, a lot of options you have. Um, so if anyone's interested, that's something that you can just look into. Um, I, I think there are even businesses that you can invest in that mine, that you're just funding them to get that um, set up and then you share profits. Um, and then moving on to the question, which has suddenly slipped my mind. And I'm gonna have to ask you for it again. Okay. Uh, the question is from Brian Mutai. And the question reads as follows. Are there any tools we can use to get started on creating verifiable, unique art on blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum? Okay, that's an excellent question. And um, I actually looked into how CryptoPunks managed to, um, to do that. So I think, I don't know about tools, the way everything is set up, but I know about marketplaces. There's a marketplace called Verisat, which is digital a digital marketplace. They they handle some of some of the the steps for you, so you can just have a look. Um, but if you wanted to do it manually, which obviously gives you more control and um, and stuff, you could create the art, um, put it together uh, like that. Uh, screenshot that I showed in the slides that had all the pieces just like in rows and um, create a, a hash of that and store that on the blockchain because it, it is difficult to to store the actual image because it's, it's those are big files so that that is one way to do it but there really are many ways I would say the first part is just getting the, the art sorted Thank, thank you very much for, for, the, for that really, uh, for your answer. Um, I've seen another two questions pop in here by the chat function, which I'll just pose to you as well. Um, the first question is from Victor. Uh, and the question reads as follows. Uh, how many bots and algos do you think are trading cryptos on Luno? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I cannot answer any Luno related questions. <laughs> No, I'm joking. I actually don't have that information at all. Um, but I would say it's probably a lot. I've seen people post on social media um, offering those services. So I, I would say probably quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was actually funny that you said you can't ask any Ludo related questions because the next question was a Ludo oh, yeah. related question. <laughs> Um, so the question, yeah, the, the question is from Sakile, and the question reads as follows: Are there no privacy issues related to storing your password with wallets like Luno? That is a potential danger in having alternative parties access your funds through knowing your password. Hmm, that's a very good question. Thanks, Sakile. Um, so I'm gonna vouch for Luno and say. Um, we take security very seriously. Um, so much so over the whole course that we've been running, which is the last seven to eight years, we've never had any security breaches, um, which can't be said for other crypto exchanges because they're definitely targeted based on that premise. Um, so there are things that you can do to ensure that this doesn't happen. For example, what we like to do, Luna, is you need to have two FA um, each time you're, you're logging in. So that's an extra layer of security and very difficult to hack. Um, and that's, I think that's kept everyone, everyone safe. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. I've also just got an additional comment for you here from Victor. He says, uh, that's a great answer, Manenga. You're a real inspiration. Oh, wow. Well, thanks a lot, Victor. Respect. <laughs> okay. So we've any more? Any, any final questions yes. before we run out of time? Yeah, we've got another five minutes to go. Um, but we did receive another question that just came in now from Wendy. Um, and she has said, other than visiting, uh, I think we use coins.com as, as you recommended, which other sites would you recommend we visit in order to get confidence to start participating in cryptocurrency related ventures? I may sound biased here, but I will say Luno. Um, this is because we, we noticed that that's, we're operating in an emerging market and Bitcoin is relatively new here. So we have dedicated teams um, that spend most of the time just working on articles, explaining concepts and uh, sharing insights into how Bitcoin works. There are many Q&A sections in there um, from various levels of difficulty. And that's the most extensive um, website I've seen that has this information. Um, apart from that, there is the official bitcoin.org, um, but I wouldn't recommend it because it is very technical. So you need to know what exactly it is that they're saying. Uh, thank you very much, Manenga. Um, I just want to say to everybody in the call, uh, in the webinar, please uh, share any additional questions. We've got another uh, four minutes left in the Q&A function, if you have. Um, I um, I would like to spend, uh, share my links. So yes. I'm just going to stop sharing for a bit. Yes, please share that in the chat function. Okay. Okay, we also just received another comment from Wendy. She says, thank you, uh, Atma, thank you, Manenga. Okay, great. Any questions on the giveaway? Is, is, is everything clear? Or is, is everyone ready with Luno? Okay, I'm also posting a promo code right there. Okay, anything else, um, even if it's not a question that you'd like me to, to share, just let me know. Uh, please also feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask uh, the question directly using the voice function. Two minutes to go. Okay, there's another question. Um, I, I've got another forum for questions. So this one just popped in. Um, okay. This one's from Elijah, again. It says, how do you expect the way regular people interact with Bitcoin will change in the coming years? And do you think it will go mainstream? Okay, that's 
it's another good question. Uh, short answer, yes. <laughs> I think it's definitely going to go in, uh, mainstream. And um, I think it will have phases. So with the first phase just being a store of value, you've got some RAND. You just, you know the RAND isn't doing great. So you want to convert that to something else that's going to hold its value better. And um, that's where Bitcoin has been for the last couple of years, even though it has dipped and some people have made losses, but on, on, um, on average, it is, has been one of the best investments of the last decade. Um, and the second phase would be a medium of exchange and uh, a means of payment, which we're starting to see with, uh, with Bitcoin these days. And um, um, the last phase is Bitcoin as a unit of account, which I think we should be seeing in the next five years. At that point, I believe it will have gone mainstream and people will be using it in many different forms. Thank you very much. I've got one last comment before we close the session. And this uh, comment is from Daniel. Uh, Daniel says, this has been a very informative webinar. I was on the fence about cryptocurrency, but now I'm, I'm leaning on the one side of the fence. Nice. I'm uh, happy to hear that, Daniel. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much for the for 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 delivering this guest lecture, Manenga. It was a really, really, really exciting um, learning experience. I speak on behalf of myself and all of the other um, attendees of the session. I want to thank everybody for joining in today as well um, and for facilitating sending through your questions. Um, I'm also glad Manenga was able to assist you with answers uh, where possible. So I think uh, over and above that, thank you very much for joining the session. And this session was recorded. So if you wanna watch it again, we will be posting it soon. Uh, keep your eyes on the Credible and Gute Joburg uh, social media pages for updates. And then over and above that, thank you all for joining today. Okay, thanks again, everyone. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you, my name. Goodbye, everyone. Oh, last, last comment. Uh, thank you for stimulate for the stimulating lecture. You gave us a lot to really think about. So yeah, last comment. So um, <laughs> before we close, goodbye everybody. <clears throat>